Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia and today we're going to rank all 27 of the Nunmine units available in the game. Now of course this tier list will once again be a reflection of my personal opinions based on my experience playing single player romance campaigns on legendary difficulty and all the figures and stats that you'll be seeing in the unit overviews will be based on large unit size on patch 1.6.1. So if you're watching in the future or playing on a different unit size, please adjust accordingly. Now I decided to start off with the Nunma unit tier list over the likes of Yellow Turban units and the Bandit units, largely because Nunma units are easier to compare as none of these units are locked behind any reforms or restricted by general classes, with the minor exception to the recruitment limits placed on all the animal units, but given their absurd power levels, those restrictions are definitely warranted, or else the entire tier list would simply look like this. But all joking aside, given the large number of diverse units we have here, we're going to take the same approach as we did with the faction unique unit tier list and drop into custom battles from time to time to look at groups of unit by type. For example, we're going to be kicking off our rankings here with all the purple or melee infantry units as we'll now head to a custom battles to look at each of their stats in game and then come back here to rank them before moving on to look at all the green units and so forth until we have completed our entire tier list. So let's get started and hop over to a custom battle to take a look at the Nai Naman melee infantry units. Alrighty, so here we are in a custom battle with Meng Huo and Zhuge Liang hanging out in the back and we have all 9 of our melee infantry units. Now they are 10 purple units for the Nanman factions as there is one of the animal units that's also purple, but we're gonna group all the animal units together in a separate category as they are very unique. So we're gonna start things off with just these 9 melee infantry. Starting with the Ravine Warriors here, which is a light axe infantry, and they are actually quite good despite their status as being one of the cheapest unit available to the Nanman roster. Now if we take a look at them, they are holding a dual wielding weapon that includes a club or a mace with also a stone axe as part of their weapon. Their role in the game is to be assault troops, they're good against shield because they are carrying that axe which will give them the axe breaker or the shield breaker bonus that gives them 65% um, debuff against enemy shield, melee evasion, and armor. So any sort of stat you see here will be decreased by 65% if this troop engage in battle with them. Aside from that, they also have the expendable keyword, which is rather important as expendable means if this unit is routed or destroyed, allies near them will not suffer from a morale debuff. Because usually, if you have allies routing near you, you will also suffer a morale penalty. But if that ally is an expendable ally, then you won't feel a thing. So it makes these guys great frontline sacrifice troops to throw at the enemy in cheap numbers. And if we look at their stat, they're not that bad. 30 morale isn't that low. 74 charge is decent for a melee infantry, especially if you consider all the figures that we'll look at in all the Nunmine units here. They have 24 attack speed, which is decent for dual wielders, 30 base damage, and 4 armor piercing. So this is where they're a little bit lacking, given all their damage is on the base value and not the armor piercing one. They have low armor, decent evasion. Now the good thing about the low armor is because they're not wearing the typical Rattan armor that Nama units are given, they're not vulnerable to flame, which is something we'll see a bit later, as fire will do massive damage to most of the Nama units. Not the case here. And then moving on, we have Nama warriors, which is once again a very typical unit in the Nama army. These guys now have a shield, use a one-handed weapon, which is also a stone axe, which also gives them the shield breaker ability. They are basically militia troops compared to the Han roster, so they have no access to advanced formations. And if we look at their breakdown, they have a little bit higher morale, higher melee charge, higher attack rate, a better damage distribution with 10 points in armor piercing, 23 in base. 
So they're going to outperform the Ravine Warriors in that aspect. Since they also have a shield, you have 60% range block chance, you have some extra stats on your shield melee evasion and shield armor. So on the surface, these guys look pretty decent, but there are some things that are working against them. Because of their higher armor, uh, given by what you see here, the Rattan armor on their chest, they're now vulnerable to fire. So minus 100% fire resistance, basically means fire will do double damage against them. And that is one of the biggest weakness of most of the Nunmai army. And given the fact that they have this and the Ravine Warrior does not, and the Ravine Warriors are cheaper and also maintain the expendable trait, which allow them to get routed, I would say these two units are fairly balanced and quite similar in comparison. Of course, if you're faced off against a bunch of range units, perhaps you would want these Namang Warriors as the shield that gives 60% range block chance is definitely better. But as a whole, if you're using these units as assault troops, maybe in an ambush, just charging into enemies, then they are quite similar. And then moving on, we have Valley Tribesmen. So these are... Once again, very similar to the unit we just saw, except for the weapon choice is going to be different. They're carrying sabers versus the axe that we seen earlier. Now these sabers surprisingly have lower armor piercing damage. It's going back to almost the same setup that we saw with the ravine warriors with heavy melee damage on the base, very low armor piercing. Because they're no longer holding axe, you don't have shield breaker. They have the higher melee attack rate because it's a one-handed weapon so 30 here with the shield 60 percent better armor which also means they are vulnerable to fire once again and what these troops are used for is sturdy frontline units uh, you see that the role is no longer assault so it's frontline and the reason for that is basically the higher armor and the shield so it's kind of designed to be anti-enemy range they're also slightly slower even though they kind of make up for that by having slightly higher melee charge bonus. And the thing that stands out about these compared to the two we just seen is they have access to formations, which is where their front line role really shines as we can put them in shield wall formation, which adds the 35% extra uh, range block chance, pushing their range block chance to 95%, which is very important for any type of frontline troop holding out against enemy range damage. They also have access to circle, which would also increase their range block chance and gives them melee evasion stat and extra charge resistance while lowering their melee attack rate. We've seen plenty of these formations in our previous tier list, so I'm not going to talk too much about them, but it's always nice to have more advanced unit that can adapt these formations. So moving on, we have Wulin fighters. Now these look like almost identical clones to the unit we just seen. They have very, very similar stat, almost same exact weapon, worse charge, and if you look at the armor distribution and the melee evasion distribution, it's almost identical except for that Wulian Fighter has less armor as well. So on paper, it seems like these unit, aside from 4 points of morale, are basically worse copies of the Valley Tribesmen, and they have access to the same exact formation but they do have one unique trait that sets them slightly apart. And that's the tribal pride, which is a general slaying trait that boosts their damage by four times if they are fighting an enemy general. So they're designed to be general killers. Now, are they effective general killers? I don't think so, because they have a few issues when fighting generals. They are, first off, a melee infantry, so not poarm. Therefore, you don't have charge reflector, you don't have ways to dismount the enemy general. Therefore, the enemy general on horseback, or on elephant in this case, are going to be easily running you over and not going to be in sustained fight with you. And even if they are in sustained fight with you, the four time damage is mainly on base damage. They have almost no armor piercing damage. Therefore, generals who tend to have at least 55% armor is going to do quite well against you. Now, of course, are they going to kill generals faster than Valley Tribesmen? Sure, four times damage, it's definitely going to be faster, but it's still not going to be effective. You're not going to recruit these thinking that they will annihilate generals. That is just simply not true. 
And if you compare the other situations where they will be not fighting generals, they're just going to perform worse than the valley tribesmen who are cheaper than these units, as all these units are lined up by increasing cost. So that is also something to take note. Then moving on, we have axe throwers. Now these are hybrid units, as in they have a melee component and a range component, which makes them quite interesting and strong. And by the name, you can see that they are using axes. They also have a shield. So one-handed weapon with shield all tend to have 30 attack speed, which is great. Their damage is a bit lower. 23 and 4 is probably the lowest figure we have seen so far. 92 charge is decent. Morale is pretty decent. They have access to formations, thus making them the first axe unit with formations, which is great news. And the formations are similar to the ones we've seen so far for all these melee infantry, shield, wall, and circle. And the shield wall, combined with the fact that they have a shield, will push their range block chance to 95%. They are wearing some armor, which makes them vulnerable to fire, unfortunately. But aside from that, the range component of their weapon is what makes them more interesting. As they run up to the enemy or as they stay at a certain amount of range, very, very low range, 50. It's meant to throw out the axes as you're charging the enemy. So you want to have your melee and your range fire well active at the same time, charge toward the enemy. As you enter the 50 range, you'll throw out a couple axes before you get into melee combat. And you're only really carrying three ammos of the axe. So it's not a range unit per se, it's more of a melee unit with some range component before you enter melee combat. But the range component is really good. You have axes that are dealing 83 armor piercing damage and 25 base. So it's a very high damage axe being thrown out there and despite the low ammo, that's going to make this unit quite strong as a shock troop as you charge in, whether you're doing this on the field because you have a shield that can protect you from enemy range, or you're doing this in an ambush coming from the side, surprising the enemy. Either way, this is a great unit, and they fit the role of an axe unit because once they are done with their range component and get into melee combat, they can shred the enemy armor and the enemy shield defense and melee evasion, based on the fact that they are using an axe. So they are definitely very useful in the army. Then moving on, we have Nanjong Champions. Now these guys, uh, first thing you notice, have a slightly more impressive looking shield, I would say, but this impressive looking shield gives them worse range block chance, 55%, which is slightly confusing. But because of the size of the shield, they're one of the only units in the Naman roster and probably in the entire game where you're not a polearm unit, but you have access to the turtle formation, which is quite good because turtle formation is one of the only formations in the game that can protect your unit from arrow towers because it's 360 degrees of shield. Therefore, there is no weakness to the over 100% range block chance and you can advance your unit well in this formation to protect them from enemy range damage and arrow tower damage. So this is a great formation to have on an axe unit and once again because they're axe unit you get the same shield breaker effect they're good against shield because of that they have access to the uh, two other formations that we have showcased so they could shield wall for 90 percent range block chance which is pretty decent and they also have access to circle and if you look at just their raw stat they have the same damage profile as the axe thrower we seen earlier which only makes the axe thrower look a little bit better because we kind of punished it for the fact that it has low melee damage, but as we move up the tiers of these axe unit, it seems like that is the axe damage that's given to all of them. And then they have slightly better armor, slightly better evasion. They're better trained version of the axe throwers with better formations, but no range component to their damage. That's the best way I can summarize them. And then moving forward, we have a more unique axe thrower. They're the Wu Guo axe throwers. They're Wu Tu Gu's unique troops. And these guys don't carry a shield, which is what's holding them back in my opinion. And they also don't have access to any formations whatsoever. They have the same exact three ammos of 83 armor piercing axe to throw, which is great. And because they're dual wielding their axes, they actually have slower attack rate, which makes them do less damage in the game, which is also slightly confusing. 
and if you look at their charge, it's not that high. They have decent morale, but overall, I think this unit is not that good because you're losing that shield and losing attack speed at the same time, and you have just the same exact amount of ammo as a regular Axe Thor. So I would go with a regular one in all cases. These are also more expensive. They are better trained in terms of melee evasion, but overall, not really worth it in my book, especially a hail of arrows would just bring you down, given that you only have 50 range. Then moving on, we have one of the more unique units in the game, the Followers of the Flames. And right off the bat, we can see why they're called that, as they have these giant maces that's lit up on fire. And these maces have splash attack damage, so that is very strong. And they're one of the few splash attack damage users with decent attack speed. 20 is not bad. Most splash attack damage dealers in the game have around 15, and their damage on the weapon itself is also pretty decent, 38 and 11. And on top of that, because it's on fire, you'll be dealing burning damage to anyone you hit, and since you're splash damaging multiple things you hit, it will reduce the person's morale, it will reduce their melee evasion, and deal fire damage over 15 seconds. And this fire damage will double against most armored Nunmine units as they are more vulnerable to fire, making these guys pretty good. Now, they're obviously not very well dressed here as you can see, so you see the low armor, which also means they're not vulnerable to fire themselves. They have low melee evasion, they have very high morale, which is great, and very low health and that's because of their smaller unit size of 90 versus the 120. So the ratio is the same. They have 75% of the health of all the other units, so per unit health is the same. So you're not really getting punished there, you're just getting punished because you have a smaller unit size, which is definitely made up by the fact that they have amazing damage. Not only is the burning damage great, the morale hit is amazing, and the melee evasion hit is amazing. So these guys, if you thought, you know, axe unit debuffs are nice, fire debuffs on your melee troops are really, really good, uh, making these guys very, very good unit in the game. And finally, we have one final unit here, and they're the Might of the Valley. Now, these guys also have a unique weapon here. They have a two-handed axe, a great axe in their hand, and it has very high damage. 46 armor piercing damage, 19 base, 15 attack rate. So a little bit slower attack rate, that's going to hurt. But what really stands out about these guys is they have super high charge. 194 charge. None of the units we've seen so far have this high charge. And given the fact that none of my units lack cavalry, these guys are going to serve that role for you. They're going to be charging out with very high melee charge damage, maybe in an ambush ideally, given that they are not carrying shields. They are wearing decent armor, it's not that high, 29%, making them vulnerable to fire, but it's still quite nice, and the fact that they have an axe as their weapon also means you get the shield breaker effect. In addition to all of that, you'll also be getting this passive buff, which will become activated once you drop below 50% health. So once this unit loses half of its health, it will gain extra damage and extra melee attack rate. So that's going to offset a lot of the low attack rate early, and that's going to last for the remainder of the battle. So it will make these guys even more powerful once they are half health, and that kind of plays along the role of using these units as assault troop. You could even charge this into the enemy front line, taking range damage to get you closer to this berserk passive buff, and then just unleash afterward as you do do massive amount of damage after this is activated. So that's the 9 units that we have. Let's pop over to the tier list and rank these 9 first before we pop back to take a look at all the poarm units. So see you guys there. Alrighty, so we just seen all 9 of these units in great detail in the game. Let's go rank these guys right now, starting with the Ravine Warriors here. Now they're obviously designed to be the expendable units, they're the cheapest, they're not that weak in terms of their damage, and the fact that they use an axe gives them quite a role in the game, and I will just give them a C rank. They're not trashed here because of the expendable trait and the fact that their cost gives them plenty of value in the game. Compared to them, the Nunmon Warriors is not that much better. They do have a shield. So you could charge them into the enemy, 
but because of their slightly better armor, they are more vulnerable to fire. And fire doesn't always come in the form of missiles here, as we have seen the Faller of Flame, which makes them obviously slightly weaker there. The fact that they use an axe is decent, and they're still relatively cheap, even though they don't have the expendable trait. So what I'm going to do with these guys is also put them in the C tier here. Then moving on, we have the Valley Tribesmen. Now the Valley Tribesmen is the first unit in this group that has formations, which makes them a bit stronger than the rest. It gives them 95% range protection, which is not only helpful against the fact none of these units are very good against range, but also the fact that these units can protect themselves from even some cavalry as they can get charge reflect from the formation themselves. So these guys are going to move up to the B tier compared to the other two. Then we have the Willing Fighters. Now these guys are pretty much worse clones of the Valley Tribesmen, which we talked about. They do get extra damage against enemy generals, but in my mind, that's not really worth it. You're not really going to run into situations where you need to utilize these troops to fight enemy generals. And even in that situation, the extra four times damage with most damage on melee base damage is not really going to do much for you. So in that aspect, they're going to be the first one that drops into the D tier for us. Then moving on, we have the Axlers, which is another wonderful unit here. They have really good damage on the throwing portion of their axe, even though their melee damage is a bit lacking. And because they have shields and decent damage profile and the fact that they actually use an axe, they're going to move up to B tier here alongside the Valley Tribesmen. Then we have the Nundrone Tribesmen. Now these guys are definitely unique from all of this group given the fact that they have access to turtle formations, which is the only thing that makes them stand out. They don't have very high damage. So we're going to actually give them A tier just for the fact that they have access to turtle, which is pretty valuable in my opinion. Then moving on, we have the Wu Guo Axe Throwers, very similar to the Wu Lin Fighters. These are actually worse versions of another unit we have. So Wulin fighters are worse versions of the Valley Tribesmen. These Wu Guo axe throwers are worse versions of the standard axe throwers, as the standard axe throwers have a shield, have access to formations, they have the same exact ammo, and I believe the axe throwers have actually higher charge. These guys have slower attack rate because they're dual wielding, so we're going to drop these guys to the D tier for sure here. Then we come to Follower of the Flame. These guys are the most unique unit of the group because they are using a flaming mace with splash damage. They would be S tier if they had slightly better defensive mechanisms because they are smaller size, lower HP, vulnerable to range. They have very special uses in your army. You have to protect them. You can't just throw them out there. They will get wiped by range, by cavalry before they have a chance to deal their damage. But once they do get into closed range combat with enemies they are very very good so we're going to give these guys a tier uh, they would have been s tier if we had a better defensive mechanism for them they have no formations as well which is also a slight weakness here then finally we have the might of the valley these guys have super high damage they have a passive that can increase their super high damage now the thing that's going to hold them back is the fact they have no shield, so their usage is going to be more towards the ambush style, or maybe if you have high replenishment, you charge these guys up first, let them lose a bunch of health, and then they become stronger, helping you to wipe out the enemy, and then you just recover post-battle, but that's going to hold them back a bit, and I can only give these guys a B tier as well. So they're not as unique as these two, both of these are probably going to serve you better in the campaign. Whereas the Might of the Valley, well, they are nice. They have to sacrifice half of their health each fight to become really strong. Then if you don't have high replenishment, you're going to be in trouble for the remainder of your campaign. So that's going to be the list for our 9 melee infantry unit. We're going to pop back over to Custom Battle to look at the polearm units next. So see you guys there. Alrighty, so we have returned to our custom battle here with all the polearm units starting with the Naman Spearmen. Now these guys, similar to the Naman Warriors, are your very standard spear units. You can see that they wear almost no armor, thus they're not vulnerable to fire. Their weapon's also not very good. It's a sharpened bamboo stick, which you would think would have higher armor piercing values, 
but it doesn't. We have 30 on the melee base, 2 on the armor piercing, not very high damage, 24 attack speed, which is pretty standard for poor units. It's a two-hander, so you don't have very high uh, attack rate here. Then moving on, we have a more advanced version here, um, very advanced actually. It's a Sunjiang Poison Spear. They have poison-tipped weapons, and they're going to be attacking slightly slower with a lot less damage on the actual weapon. It's a shorter spear as well. Also wearing almost no armors, and the poison effect, very similar to the burning effect we seen earlier, will do continuous damage over time. So their actual damage output is going to be higher. Now the problem I have with this is, unlike most unit with fire damage or with poison damage, these are poison damage that you will apply in melee. So you can't apply it and let the poison tick out during the 15 seconds because it's not going to be repeatedly stacked damage. It's going to refresh every 15 seconds, so you're only refreshing the duration of your poison. So if I stab you this one second, you have 15 seconds of this damage. If I stab you the very next second, you have 16 seconds of this damage. So you're actually wasting a lot of this poison. Now, the flip side is, unlike arrows, you never run out of your poison spear. The poison is not going to dilute itself. So you will continuously be able to apply your poison as long as this unit's alive. So that's good. But you can't hide. You have to take damage. And you're not very good at taking damage, given how little armor you're wearing. So I don't think their role is that great. Now, they are a poor unit, like the spearmen we just seen. So they both are good against cavalry. You can brace yourself and charge reflect. You will take massive damage back as well, because reflector is not negation. Two different concepts. Um, but these guys have a more interesting role in the game. Then moving on, we have the Nanjong spearmen. These are obviously slightly more skilled. They have access to formations. You can see that we have the spear wall, which will increase our charge resistance, which is our resistance against how much knockback the enemy cavalry can deal to us. Pretty much at 2000%, they're not going to really push our line at all. We have higher melee evasion. Lose 100% range block chance does not matter. We don't have any to begin with. And that is the weakness of this unit. We have slightly better armor, which makes us more vulnerable to fire, and no range block chance, which makes us vulnerable to enemy arrows as well. Not a great situation to be in. Obviously a slightly better weapon though. We have 20 attack, so it's slightly slower, but with 33 base damage and 13 armor piercing. Also pretty decent charge. So this unit is definitely slightly more advanced compared to the two we just seen, in terms of how we can utilize them as some sort of flank protector against enemy cavalry. That's kind of the role that they have. They can't really survive on the front line given their low armor and almost no range block chance. Then moving on, we have this unit here, the Javelin Spearmen. So they carry extra spears on the back, similar to the axe throwers we seen earlier. They have a range component, so when they charge up, they can throw those javelins out before they get into melee combat. The range is slightly higher than axes, 60 versus 50. The attack rate is also slightly faster, slightly lower damage. Not as crazy as 83, but 55 is not bad with 20 base. And you have 5 ammo instead of 3. So overall, you're going to be dealing more damage. Um, slightly more, because if you do 3 times 83, you're at uh, close to 250. 5 times 55, you're close to 275. Slightly more overall damage. Also, the weapon itself is slightly better too, if we mention that. And it's designed to be a charging unit, because you have 112 melee charge bonus. You want to charge these out, maybe in ambush. They'll throw a couple javelins on the charge and then clash into the enemy. And for defensive purposes, they will do fine as a flank protector against enemy cavalry, because you do have... The pole arm, which gives you charge reflector against mounted automatically when they're braced. Then we get to some serious pole arm units with shield, which is one of the minimum requirement in my mind for a decent frontline unit. And these javelin spear guards are going to play that role. Now, similar to the regular spear guard unit you see in the Han roster, these guys have bigger shield, 55% range block chance, access to the turtle formation, which is excellent. And they have some throwing javelins on top of that. 
So they have three ammo instead of five, not exactly designed to be a more javelin focused unit, tend to be more of a spear guard focused unit. But having that option is actually pretty good because you can actually utilize these throwing spears while in turtle. So you can turtle formation up, making you invincible to arrow towers, to enemy range, walk these unit up towards enemy formations, and as you move, you can throw the spears. So that's actually a pretty neat formation to utilize, and you'll do plenty of damage before you run out. Uh, you pretty much do massive damage to whatever's on the enemy front line. Then you get into up close into a more melee fight. You have decent charge. You pretty much want to break your formation before you get close so you can deal the charge. You have better attack speed with decent damage. You lost a little bit of armor piercing, especially if you compare them to this 33 and 13. This one 33 and 13 as well, but both of these had 20 attack rate. This one you're at 24 attack rate with 39 base and 8. So you traded off some of your armor piercing for the regular damage and that's not that bad given that you have 24 attack speed here with still very good charge, access to some very good formations while maintaining three ammos on yourself. So pretty good unit here. And if you look at the unit card before we leave these guys, they have encourage ally. So they have the encourage trait as well, which means they'll boost everyone's morale around them, which is also why they're excellent frontline units. Then we have another unit with big shield. These are called shields of the south. So you think there will be really good shield unit. They also have access to turtle. Basically the requirements of big visual shield in the game and they can do similar stuff. They can't throw any javelins because they don't actually have any javelins. They're also holding a worse weapon, 24 speed, 30 base, two armor piercing, much worse in my opinion. You're also wearing the heavier armor, thus making you vulnerable to fire, lower charge. They're more designed to just stand there on the front line versus the one we just seen. They also have encourage, which is nice. But overall, if you compare the versatility and the abilities of the last two units we've seen and cost, these are once again ordered by cost, except for the last two units, which are a little bit special. We'll talk about those a bit later. But in general here, the shield of the south is just not as good as the javelin spear guard because javelin spear guard will do better in holding the position given their extra damage on their spear, same formation, and the fact they can throw some damage back when the enemies are charging at us or when we are charging an enemy, and they can also be used as the charging unit themselves. So I would say these guys just outrank them uh, pretty much everywhere. Then finally we have two unique units here. Now the reason why they're split off to the side is because they have an issue in the game right now. Wolf Packs is this unit that has a special trait similar to Imperial units, where if you have a friendly unit nearby with the same exact skill or basically a copy of yourself, multiple wolf pack nearby, they'll gain bonuses. 100% extra melee charge bonus, 50% charge speed, and 50% speed, and cause terror. Those effects currently do not work in the game. It will get patched in the future, I'm positive of that. And once it gets patched and it works, this unit will be amazing. In terms of cost, they are the second cheapest pull arm unit, so they're actually quite cheap. They wear decent amount of armor, uh, which makes them vulnerable to fire, which is not a good thing. They cause scare already, and they cause terror. Those two will stack. So that's about eight points of morale just by having this unit nearby. And they will have the same charge reflector if you want to use them as flank protection. Obviously, they are not good against enemy arrows. They also carry javelin, so they will throw out five ammo worth of javelin as they charge. And if you do have the pack hunter skill active, the melee charge bonus will be 168, which is pretty strong. They have the highest damage available in pull arm, 24, 39, 8, which we've seen also on the javelin spear guards. Very good stats. And you also have you know, maximum ammo, the increase in speed is also not to be underestimated. Your base speed goes up to 64, 65, which is close to a heavily armored cataphract speed, which is pretty good. If you can run on foot as fast as a cataphract, that's not shabby, especially if you get extra 50% boost to charge speed on top of that. So if you select onto a unit to charge them, you'll move even faster. So 
these guys are quite good. We're just waiting for the patch to get these fixed and spamming wolf packs will be a very viable option as you have a combination of javelin, high charge, high damage, a uh, pull armor unit that you could use to flank protect against enemy cavalries. And that's going to wrap it up for our pull armor units as we're going to pop back into the tier list to rank these guys. So see you guys there. Alrighty, so we just took a look at all the pull arm units. Let's rank them according to what we know. So starting off with the Naman Spearmen, these guys are really the most basic unit. No shield, no formations, no real damage, holding a big bamboo stick like most of the other unit. They're going to get the D tier here. They're just not very useful in any situation. They are cheap, but they're not expendable, so they wouldn't even fit in where the Ravine Warrior was. Compared to them, we have the Wolf Pack. Now that's the ratio of the price. They're the second cheapest. That's why I have put them here. They're excellent if the skill works. And I'm going to assume them in this ranking that the skill is going to work in the future. So assuming their ability is functioning, then they're going to get an A tier. They're one of the more aggressive pull arm units that you can utilize in the game. And there's not any cavalry among the Nunman faction. Therefore, you need some sort of charging unit and given their extra speed when they're in their wolf pack active ability, they're gonna fit that role for you and they have the versatility of having range as well as melee and their melee damage is also quite high. They're also very cheap. All that combined with scare and terror, these guys are gonna be your go-to unit, especially in ambushes. Imagine having these guys charge out the forest with scare and terror, high speed, javelins coming in at the enemy unit. Then we have the Sanjiang Poison Spear. These guys have very low damage. The poison tick obviously helps, but because of the way it's applied, which I mentioned already when we did the overview, I don't think they're very good. So they're going to fall to D tier here. Poison is not a bad damage option. It's definitely not as good as fire as you see the fire debuff you get from melee evasion and morale that you see on the followers of the flame. Poison is just an extra damage tick and they do lose a lot of damage on their regular spear. So we're going to be dropping them back quite a bit. Then we have the Nanjong Spearmen. These guys are slightly better than the Spearmen we seen earlier, the Naman Spearmen. But I don't think the improvement is going to push them very far. They do have access to formation, so I'm not going to dismiss them entirely as D tier. They're going to drop into C. You can put them on the flanks away from enemy range, protect your flanks or your vulnerable units from enemy cavalry charges if you're fighting the Han forces. So they do have a role. They're not that expensive, so I would put them here. Now, someone who's better than them with very similar stat is Javelin Spearman, which we have seen because of how much ammo they have on their Javelin. Now, because Wolf Packs exist, these guys are not going to rank as high as what they would usually rank if we're just comparing them to a unit like the Nanjong Spearman. Because you can think of the Wolf Pack as cheaper versions of Javelin Spearman, same ammo, same damage, higher damage on the spear better abilities if you have multiple ones. So with all that factor involved, these guys are gonna drop down to C. They're gonna be sort of the similar state as the Nanjong Spearmen, even though head to head, I would put these guys ahead of them because of the versatility and the range. But unlike all those units, our next unit, the Javelin Spear Guards, are gonna be our first S tier unit here in the Nanman tier list. They have turtle, they have javelins, they have formations, they have uh, good stats on their damage and they fit a role that is needed in every army. They're good at anti-range, they're good at anti-cavalry, they're sturdy frontline, they have encourage for their allies, and they're not that expensive because their expensive counterpart, the Shield of the South, which is coming up next, is a similar unit without the range component at a higher price. Therefore, in this scenario, I tend to drop these similar units down quite a bit because these guys exist. I will never recruit these guys. Therefore, they're not really going to make it on our tier list, even though head to head, they're going to be better than some of the other units. So they're only going to go into the C tier. They're not bad enough to drop into D tier. This is more of a statement of saying, because these guys are S, they're going to be C because you're never going to recruit these guys. They're cheaper, better, 
with more uses. So now with all the polearm units ranked alongside all the melee infantry, we're going to go in and take a look at all the range units before going to everyone's favorites, animal units. So let's pop back in custom battle and talk about all the range units. Alrighty guys, so we're back here with all the range units and we have the Numan Slingers. So similar to the Numan Warriors and Numan Spearmen, they're the mainstay of the army. Now like the Ravine Warriors, these guys are expendable. So they have that going for them. No formations, no armor, thus not weak to fire. That's something we have to take note of. Very high attack speed. Slingers have very high attack speed. Limited range. But that's to be expected. They still outrange javelins and axes. Very, very high ammo. Damage looks kind of bad, right? We have 25 base versus 6 armor piercing. But if we take a look at all the options, it's not that crazy. It's very similar to a lot of your archer and archer militia of the Han army. And given their very high attack rate, I would say if you're in a direct shootout, not considering range, they'll probably outperform a lot of the archer and archer militia that the Han has because they shoot almost twice as fast with about the same damage. And the fact that they carry so much ammo pretty much means they're unlimited if you're going up against a lot of melee troops where they can't reach you. Maybe it's a siege battle, maybe it's an encampment battle, but a lot of free fire, a lot of good damage, and even if you do get these guys killed, your army is not going to be really mad at you because they're expendable and they're cheap. Then moving on, we have Wuling Slingers. So like the Wuling Fighters, these are once again going to be somewhat worse versions of what we've seen so far. So what I mean by that is they have no special trait. These are not general killers like the Wuling Fighters. They cost more than the Slingers. They have the same exact damage profile. Three more ammos is all you get. And that's considering three more than 99. So it's not like you're carrying five javelins versus eight javelins. You're carrying 99 stones versus 102 stones. Really nothing to say about it. And they are wearing better armor, which means they become more vulnerable to fire. They do not have expendable. They can cross all terrain without losing movement penalty not a big deal with the Nunma units and overall i just feel like you're paying extra for stats that is non-existent and even if you look at the melee stats 53 charge 30 attack rate 15 2 look at these guys 44 charge is obviously lower 30 attack speed same speed 5 11. i could make a very safe and fair argument that 5 11 is a lot better than 15 2. So even in melee, Naman Slingers are going to do better than these Wuling Slingers. So much like the Wuling Fighters, not much of an improvement over their standard counterpart. Then we have the best unit here, Fire Archers. And the reason is super simple. It's in their name. They shoot fire arrows. And if we learn anything at looking at all the Nama units so far, is Nama units are really bad against fire. So for these guys, you're doing double damage against most Naman units. You have the standard range where most Naman range units do not have. You have 200 range. 45 ammo is pretty good. Damage is obviously lower and more heavily on the melee base version because you are shooting fire arrows and your firing rate is going to be slower. But there is nothing that compares, especially if you're fighting in the Naman region, which you have to when you play as a Naman faction. Lots of trees, lots of things for you to burn down. And they have the same exact weapon as the slingers, the regular slingers. Therefore, it's not that bad. 30 attack speed, 5 damage, 11 armor piercing, decent unit. They are also not wearing armor. Therefore, they're not vulnerable to fire themselves. A good thing, because sometimes trees above you will catch on fire. And you have to be careful not to burn these units yourself. So this is an excellent unit here. Then moving on, we have a Sanjiang Poison Dart, similar to the Sanjiang Spearman we seen earlier. These guys have poison weapons on their dart, which in my opinion is better than on a spear, because you can apply once, wait it out, apply again, especially in a siege fight. 
Now, blow dart units, unlike a lot of the other ranged units, don't have a, as much of an arc on their shots, similar to crossbow, but even worse. So you need a good clear line of sight to utilize these guys. They are wearing decent armor, therefore they are going to be vulnerable to fire, and they have basically, you know, poison unit. They, they do have some trait that helps them. They have stock, which means they can move well hidden in any terrain, sneak up on their troop. 60 range is quite low, almost no damage. You fire and then you run that's kind of how you want to utilize these very micro intensive you want to spread your shots on maybe all the targets you run up to an enemy unit shoot a couple time on each of their unit run back rinse and repeat and that maximizes your damage it's a lot of work but they could do a ton of damage if you do utilize them correctly there then moving on we have the javelin throwers they look like the two versions of the javelins that we've seen earlier their formations are going to be different. They have a shield wall, which is pretty good. They have a shield. It's not the same as the shield wall that we have seen on the other units uh, from the melee infantry, which is 35% range block chance. The spear shield wall gives you 15%. So these guys are only going to be at 75, which is still great. Uh, charge reflector cannot run. They can still move. They have circle. No access to turtle is the big difference from the other poem units. And they're not considered a poem units even though they are holding javelins. So you don't see stuff like charge reflector against large. That's going to make them a lot weaker compared to some of the other variants of the javelin units we've seen so far. They make up for that by holding on to about twice as many javelins as the other units. But I wouldn't recruit them because they lack the versatility of countering cavalry where everyone else that we've seen so far have. And they're also not as good as countering enemy range because the formation's a little bit worse and also no turtle. Damage is also worse, 24-32 versus the 39-11, I believe we've seen earlier. And charge is not as high as well. So they're mainly a range unit first, then a spear unit, even though they're not even given the polearm bonuses. So not as good. Then finally, we have a more advanced dart unit, the Hidden Vipers. So these guys, in terms of what makes them stand out, is they have better melee stats, so they can fight a little bit better. 30 attack speed, 31-4, which is nothing too crazy. The same stat as like Wulian Fighters. They have a big shield, 60%. So in straight up shootouts with other units, especially other range units, you'll do better there. You have an interesting formation in the mixed missile, which gives half your units availability to fire while the other half will hold the front line. They are okay. I would still think most dart units require quite a bit of microing. Uh, they are using poison darts once again, and that's really what's holding them back. If you prefer to micro and want to maximize damage with poison unit, you can do it. Um, I'm not saying poison damage is just bad, it's just not as good as say fire and you can do a lot more with fire aside from hurting troops you can burn towns you can burn towers you can burn forests and have other effects on top of that uh, but overall very similar unit to the other uh, sunjiang poison dart we've seen you can see that they have less ammo uh, same damage same attack speed they have a shield that's their strength i believe they also have stock so there's no difference there as well extra formation although i would say that this formation kind of defeats the purpose of having a stock unit you're not intending for them to get into combat the poison units there to get in and out of combat hide and go back in and play the poison again so there we have it there's only six range units and we've seen them all so let's hop back over to the tier list and rank these Alrighty, so we've seen all the range units let's start ranking them starting with the regular naman slingers so these slinger units have expendable, which adds a lot of points in my book. Uh, they have high ammo, they have high attack speed, decent damage. You might think it's low, but I think it's actually pretty decent if you compare it to a lot of the Han units. It's actually pretty good. So I'm going to actually put these guys into the B tier. They're pretty good units. By comparison, the Wuling Slingers, costing more, with 3 extra ammo, with worse melee stats, are going to drop quite a bit. Uh, they're going to go to D tier. Uh, not because they are trash. I mean, I guess they are. But with the comparison here, 
you have slightly better armor, which makes you worse against fire. You don't have expendable. You don't have any extra range stats. You have worse melee stats compared to the regular slinger. You're just going to drop a bunch on the list. Then you have fire archers. Uh, fire archers are going to be our S tier units. They are good against everything on this list because of they have fire. If we consider the fact that Nanman have no access to siege weapons, if you come up against Han settlements and towers, fire archers are going to be your solution to a lot of that problem that otherwise you would need to depend on trebuchets to solve. So fire arrows are what's going to carry these units and why they are S tier for the Nanman units. Then we have the Sanjiang Poison Darts, and they are decent. I think for both of these dart units here, it's kind of hard to rank them. I think depends on how you like to play. Me, personally, I'd rather just get the Fire Archers and forget about it. So I think both of these units are going to be C tier for me. They just take a bit more effort, and they're going to get ranked the same, even though clearly this variant's better, but you also pay more for them. So there's an argument there. In the area where they're better, as in they can fight in melee better, doesn't add a lot of points. It's not like they are Chen Royal Guards, which has a mixed missile formation that gives them charge negation. These guys have a mixed missile formation that gives them no extra stat. So you're just separating your unit into half melee, half range which isn't that great in my opinion. So they're both going to go to C tier here. You can still make pretty good use of these poison unit, so they're not completely terrible. Then you have a javelin unit here. Now the javelin unit is going to be a little strange because we also have to kind of compare them to the other javelin units that we have. So there's a standard javelin unit on the pole arm here and also the one that we put the javelin spear guard all the way at S tier. I think they're going to share a spot uh, with their polearm counterpart here. They have a shield, which beats them, but they don't have charge reflect, which means they beat them. So I think they're going to come about even here. So that's all the polearm units in the game. Let's hop back into custom battle and take a look at the animal units before we come back here and complete our tier list. So see you guys there. Alrighty guys, so we're here with the last group of unit, the ones that everyone's been waiting for. This is the animal unit, starting with the Tiger Warriors. These are the new additions in the Furious Wild that everyone's clamoring about. They're amazing. And if we look at the first one here, Tiger Warriors, like the two Tiger units that we have, are basically one small size unit of regular troops, plus their pet Tigers, which you can release where they run off to charge at units within range, and then you can no longer control them. They will chase whoever they like, they will try to kill whoever they like. All enemies, they won't attack friendly. And then you're left with 30 groups of basic Ravine Warriors. That's what I would say. Better Ravine Warriors, higher damage. 24, 38, 11. That portion of the damage is on the unit themselves. They are wearing armor, they are using axe, they have the same exact effects, they're assault troops. They're always unbreakable. I think this is the design reason to bypass the fact that you don't want your tigers to ever rout. So the unit themselves is given unbreakable, so despite their small size, they will fight to the last men. And that's pretty nice, decent damage on the unit themselves. The tigers is where things become very interesting. They have extremely high melee charge bonus. So 502 here, they will knock pretty much any units to the ground and you have no say on that so the best thing you can do is put them within range or barely in range you'll see a big circle indicator of their range of the unit you want them to attack and then you just click this button and they just go so then they're on their own they could chase that routing unit all the way to the edge of the map and then come back and roam around nothing you can really do to control them but they look amazing let's just say that and they hurt one-on-one, -on -one, you release these 30 Tigers onto an enemy unit, that enemy unit is going to be doomed. It's more disruptive than pure damage, because knockback doesn't always carry a lot of damage, but you're going to be disrupting that formation. If they are spear units, they're going to be all knocked to the ground, and you can charge into an encampment or a city. They're going to clear the way for you, and they will continue to do damage, although they're a bit vulnerable. Not a lot of health on these boys, so they will, they will die off as they fight. 
Then you have a different version here. Now this version here obviously look less armored. The unit themselves is also different. It's a slinger unit. So you see high ammo, low damage, same damage profile, same range, same uh, attack speed. So very similar to a regular slinger unit. These tigers have slightly less charge, or maybe I shouldn't say slightly, a lot less charge, uh, but same effect. Uh, their spare weapon apparently is also an axe, which is a little bit different from slingers. So they also have the shield breaker ability. They're also wearing some armor, so they also have fire resistance, but those are all on the unit themselves, not on the tigers. The tigers just has this charge number that you have to look at. So the only difference between the two tigers is that these tigers have lower charge. Uh, thus less knockback, less disruption, but equally deadly. I think there's a damage figure for the Tigers as well behind the scenes, but it's just not displayed on the unit card, and it's quite high. And the weakness is the same. Very fragile units, uh, once you get the initial charge in and all the damage out, you're gonna likely die in the fight. Compared to them, we have Elephant units, which are pretty amazing, starting with these slightly weaker Southern Elephants. So I say slightly weaker, relatively because elephants are just really really strong they are given small unit size 12 units per elephant on large unit size that's what we're showcasing on they are given siege attacker so they can act as a siege weapon you don't have to wait a turn to fight walled settlements um, they can bash down gates if you need them to uh, discipline nor force penalty nothing too special there they have decent health for their small unit size, right? You have 40k for 30 units versus 48k for 12 units. So each of these guys carry 4k health, which is pretty decent. Uh, each general, by comparison, a uh, champion has around 20k health on this unit size, and the strategist has 10k health. So they're about half health of a strategist. Not too bad. Uh, high charge, once again, high damage. For once, these damage figures are related to the animal themselves, as they carry slingers on the top, and the slingers themselves have very similar damage profile. Less ammo as your regular slinger unit. They have decent speed, matching that of a heavy cataphract, which we have used as a comparison before. No armor on these boys on top, therefore not extra vulnerable to um, fire arrows. The charge figure is a little bit deceptive because of the mass of these units, so they will cause a lot more knockback than usual compared to regular cavalry, and that's to be expected from your elephant unit, and they are just amazing. If you used them before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, checked out our Nanman Let's Play on Meng Huo, and where we pretty much united the tribes on the backs of two elephants. Uh, moving on, they have a slightly upgraded version. The war elephants. Uh, these guys are better charge figure compared to the rest. I mean, there's really no comparison. They are just elephants. 12% extra melee evasion versus 9%. Slower attack speed on the slingers on top of them, but almost 130 extra charge. Same exact evasion. There's just nothing too different about them. Oh, they're given mighty knockback. Right. So I guess that's key. So they are going to be a more disruptive unit, cause extra damage when knocking enemy back, and you're going to be knocking back plenty of enemy given your mass and charge bonus. Same exact speed. And finally, we have one more elephant variety that carries a set of drums on their back, and they play songs. Now, this is my favorite elephant unit in the game, not because they play music, but they have a choice of three songs. The first song gives them 15% speed bonus and immune to fatigue to everyone within 75 range so it's every unit constantly the cooldown is to switch songs then the second variation of the song just extra damage 15% for all damage types or 15 morale plus 15% melee evasion of the three this one is the best one because of fatigue immunity elephant units require charging for damage if you get fatigued, you're not going to do as much. Therefore, having fatigue immunity is huge, and giving it to other elephant units around you is also huge. And if you have three Nanjong elephants in your army, have them play all three songs. Each one can play a different song, and you can get all of these bonuses on all your allies near you. They have the weakest charge compared to the other elephants. 
uh, but they make up for it by the amount of utility they provide. They also don't have slinger units on top because they have drummers busy playing songs on top and they are more of a support unit. Uh, still, tons of damage. Monghua campaign basically use these guys to win the Unite the Tribe portion of the game. And that's going to be all the units we have seen. Let's hop back into the tier list and finish our ranking. See you guys there. Alrighty, so we finished taking a look at all the units and we can finally finish our ranking here by ranking all the animals. Now it's going to be pretty easy to rank these animal units as they're all very, very good. Now the tiger units are both going to get A tier rankings for me. They're not S tier. They're excellent, but the excellent portion of their unit is the tigers themselves. And you can't have any control over them except for when you release them. So you can kind of place them on the map where you can target one or two units, release them to make sure they kill those units for you, and then they're just going to run wild. Sure, sometimes running wild is not so bad, but there's a lot of times where I experience these tigers running off the map beyond the range of the map, chasing down routing units, and then returning like five minutes later to find their next target. And you can't control what target they're looking for. So if you have a bunch of routed units on the map all over the place, your tiger could just be wasting their time running around. And they also tend to be a lot more fragile compared to the elephants that we're about to rank. So they're obviously not going to be as great. And it doesn't really matter which one of these two tiger get ranked above each other. Obviously, the warrior variant has more armor and more charge and the unit has more damage so perhaps they will be better than the slinger variant but you're also restricted in how many of each you can recruit so just recruit as many as you can they're obviously still wonderful units to include in your army and then we have the elephants um the important part is which one is the best and i think the best elephant is actually the nunjong elephants they have the worst charge i understand but even at 200 plus charge it's enough the song that gives all your units immune fatigue or fatigue immunity, it's so important for elephant units because if you get tired and bogged down, you will get killed. 4k health is not that much. You want to always charge your elephants through enemy units, knock them all down, kill them, then shift back and do it again and again. And having extra speed and fatigue immunity is very important for that. Therefore, the Nanjo Elephants are going to be first, and then the War Elephants are going to be second because they have outstanding charge, 400 plus, plus Mighty Knockback, just amazing. And then Southern Elephant isn't too shabby themselves. 300 plus charge bonus, the most recruitment slots available. You can get more of them. Get as many Elephants as you can. They're just wonderful units. If you're playing the Nanmans, you're not getting Elephants, you're doing something wrong. If you're playing Han factions near them, and you could get a captured general with elephant unit, that's the dream. So this is our Nanman tier list. Hopefully you guys enjoy this and come back next time for the yellow turban units. See you guys then. Bye.